Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're blessed by the presence of Ryan Paul Gates, founder of Terrestrial Fungi. Ryan has spent the last 10 plus years collecting and breeding fungal cultures from around the world. The strains he's probably most famous for propagating and breeding are cordyceps and Ganoderma mushrooms. Ryan was an early pioneer when it comes to popularizing cordyceps cultivation in the U.S., exposing us all to techniques from all around the globe. His team at Terrestrial Fungi are constantly hunting and breeding new and improved strains to add to their already staggering genetic library. And especially when it comes to cordyceps, they're constantly refining their selection process to bring cordyceps farmers reliable and high-yielding potent genetics. In the summer of 2019 alone, they collected over 200 wild cordyceps militaris ascospore isolates from over 30 carefully selected wild specimens. Now, this builds on their work of releasing the first single ascospore progeny strains of Cordyceps Militaris in the USA. A master manifester, an elevator of vibration, you can tell that Ryan puts the highest intention and care into his work, and the strains of potent medicinal mushrooms he has bred really look like works of art. I'm excited to learn more about his arcane fungi abilities at manipulating these beautiful terrestrial fungi. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, I am really excited. You're someone whose work I followed since before there was even a mushroom hour. Uh, one of those early influences when it comes to DIY cultivation and breeding and all that good stuff. So this is a, a huge privilege for me. I appreciate you making the time. Of course. I'm really, uh, really happy to hear that. And from the moment that I saw your page on Instagram, you know, I really... I fell in love with just your presence and your personality. And, and I immediately, you know, I noticed that you're just, you're very relatable, very likable. And uh, I've had other people that I've met, you know, in certain situations just be like, you know, that mushroom hour guy. So it's, it's an honor to be on here. Thank you for asking me to be here. Oh, right on, right on. Well, we've got a lot to talk about when it comes to mycology, when it comes to what you're doing with cordyceps, with Ganoderma, anyone who does follow your page has seen the insane looking antlers of Ganoderma you have the wild alien looking Cheetos of all shapes and sizes that you've got on there as well. Uh, but I'm really curious before we get into the specifics of what got you into fungi. I mean, what got you into maybe to nature and doing any kind of DIY science? Maybe those are all in the same, but what, what was that sequence of events? I guess, you know, when I was a kid, I used to pick up a lot of sticks and, you know, just like <laughs> I, I would like sticks and there were, there were certain movies I watched you know like like Willow was one where you know he's got this magical stick this wand you know and I was lucky to where we went on a decent amount of camping trips you know as a kid as a family my mom and dad they were both avid gardeners you know my dad would compost and stuff like that so I had some of those things kind of inserted and then my crazy old Polish grandmother on my mom's side she would always like pick agaricus mushrooms and, and eat those and everybody would always make fun of her thinking she was going to poison herself and you know stuff like that that was kind of my early I guess exposure to nature I always loved bugs and picking up bugs at least the ones that didn't like creep me out as far as touching them and stuff <laughs> right. like that really as as I got older coming into like college and stuff like that it was really coming into eating psilocybin mushrooms with some friends in the woods and uh, kind of being inoculated at that point. And uh, that just completely shattering. I, I wouldn't say shattering because I, I guess I had some of those things in, in my essence from some things I had read about and some things that I studied. You know, I got into reading on arrowid.org when I was, you know, in high school a little bit and was just like starting to get really fascinated with transforming consciousness and what that really really means, I guess, and exploring that and trying to learn about those types of things. That really kind of cracked me open was that first experience. And luckily, I came into it with people that were very respectful towards that medicine. You know, they, right. they took me to the woods. We weren't in some sort of party or unsafe environment. Immediately, it felt like something very significant in my life at that point. A powerful experience in changing one's consciousness using psilocybin mushrooms has an indelible effect. And it's funny how it's usually like an ambassador and introduces us to this whole kingdom fungi. And suddenly you start noticing every mushroom more. I mean, there's eventually someone's going to put out some kind of study or narrative about how it does exactly that. 
you know, because anecdotally, that definitely, definitely seems to be the case. I guess then what came first for you? Was it working in the lab or was it going out to hunt wild mushrooms that really got you into kingdom fungi outside of anything psychoactive? You know, it was all kind of, it all kind of happened at the same time, you sure. know, particularly uh, the first thing I think I remember actually culturing was like I sterilized some grains and I put a piece of a wild oyster stem butt, you know, pleurotus into this jar of sterile grain. And I got this to grow, you know, like this. And then, of course, I was like online looking and ordering spores and stuff like that. It all kind of happened at the same time. You know, there were mushrooms fruiting outside and I found some things that were usable at the time and kind of started exploring in that regard. Well, and they go hand in hand, right? Now you've kind of worked your way pretty far along the line. Like what you're doing now, super specialized, high level citizen mycology work, if you will. How did you educate yourself to get there? I mean, was this a process of just trial and error, getting every book you could, researching online? Were there any specific mentors maybe or like mycology groups or anything that really accelerated your journey? Or what was that process of building to where you are now? You know, this was over 10 years ago that I was really kind of coming into this stuff and, and starting to focus on it. And at the time, Facebook was kind of in its infancy. The best resource for me at the time was the shroomery. You know, I mean, there was all kinds of information on there. And there still is, you know, to this day, if you know how to search through the forums. I mean, I've kind of, I've never been very active personally. I was always a lurker. So I don't think as charged for her not necessarily reciprocating, but I'd like to think hopefully I've invested and paid it forward into other you know, mediums now and other platforms. For uh, sure. So at the time, it was really the shroomery and that kind of came into it. You know, I watched all the, the Roger Rabbit videos, the uh, Let's Grow Mushrooms or whatever. Those yeah. were really, really helpful. You know, those, I mean, those are super valuable resources. And then of course, like coming into Paul Stamets eventually. And early on, I was kind of into this stuff, but then shortly, like must've been a few years into kind of my journey with this, that ways that mushrooms can save the planet video, I think came out, you know, Paul Stamets thing. And that was like really reigniting for me as well, even though I was already kind of focused on this sort of thing. It was, it kind of gave me an indication as to where this was going and how mainstream it was actually going to become and how high in demand mushrooms were about to be. After that, really just kept developing, you know, on my work, eventually started growing Ganoderma and uh, just really fell in love with their essence. As far as mentors and stuff on this this path for me i mean there have been people along the way like people's studies that i've read like this guy bushan shrestha who he did, did some studies on the mating system in cordyceps militaris some of the, the findings in those studies were what led me to develop my own techniques for isolating ascospores and those types of things but you know for the most part besides reading books and watching videos and stuff like that i've been self-taught quote unquote you know i think that's a that's kind of a misnomer sort of phrase being self-taught in anything because uh, we're, we're constantly drawing from what we're experiencing. You know, I mean, there's so much appropriation that has happened like from the advances that Asian culture has made towards mushroom cultivation and how we've adopted so much of that, even just from seeing their successes in that regard. So I have to really say my thanks to all of the amazing researchers that have come before us that have been in this field for like 30 years, you know? Um, well, and a teacher, sometimes, you know, our biggest mentors and teachers are people we've never met. Absolutely. And so for me, it's been, it's been a lot of sort of like astral learning, you know, in this, this way right. that uh, I haven't been able to meet a lot of these people uh, that I've really studied with, which is very different than like, you know, certain traditions of learning, you know, you have this continuum, you know, whereas my experience has been sort of like this disconnection in a sort of different way and sort of piecing the puzzle together, you know, whereas other, other things that I've learned in my life, I had regular guidance and regular ways of going through it. Yeah, and it just shows how eminently attainable this kind of knowledge is to where you can go out on your own and there's enough resource out there now where your own self-led journey, you can piece together enough to be successful and do something amazing and do something impactful. For you, was there a decision on what you were going to focus on? Because I think you've got like a pretty specific niche now where you're hunting out rare strains, like I said in the intro, cordyceps and ganoderma you're crossbreeding them, you're kind of this like supplier of mushroom farms with amazing genetics. Was that like a conscious decision for you? Or was that just something you pursued? Because that's what you were the most interested in? 
you try to look at the root of all of this stuff and it, it's just this complex web of happenings and synchronicities that come together to sort of bring you into this and paint the picture, you know, and for a long time, I really, in many ways, like resisted being the mushroom guy. It was sort of like, uh, you know, I still wanted to, to, to still have music be a good portion of like what I was doing and not, that never flowed the same way on like a career level, on a success level, like financially, as much as mushrooms did for me. When I really look back on all of it and everything that I've learned from music, you know, and all of the, the pathways that I've developed through that physical practice of like developing my skills on, an, on many instruments, you know, and what that neural network is now doing, it was built with totally different tools and stuff. And now it's being used to like travel into this ethereal brainstorming space of like trying to figure out and communicate with these fungi. So for me, it's like looking back on this, it literally taps into every skill that I've developed from running sound in a high school musical or something to like random web design work I did when I was in high school and, and stuff like that. You know, like everything in order for me to do this work, it involves every thing that I've done. Yeah, I think that puts it beautifully. And it reminds me of this story that my wife and I love, the story of Fatima. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a, you know, I'm going to forget exactly which country it came from, but it's basically a story of a woman who continually gets lost at sea, crashes up on shore on some new land, learns a skill, has that be useful to her, gets her to the next place, but then she ends up kind of coming to another new land, learning another new skill. And then by the end of it, it was all those skills that she had gathered by <laughs> crashing on shore and kind of something out of her control led her to these places where she learned skills and suddenly all those came into being at her final destination. So a little bit of the story of Fatima in the story of Ryan. I like that. I like that. Yeah, a lot. I mean, I, I have goosebumps hearing you you say that because it's literally been so many situations there that life has intervened and it's been like, oh, well, you can't do that anymore. And so you have to focus on this. One story that comes to mind is uh, last summer, you know, and I've been, I've been growing cordyceps or at least attempting to grow them since like 2013 and finally had success at the, I think at the end of like 2015 or something with, with a strain that William had cultured, William Padilla Brown, uh, he cultured it from a specimen that Charlie Aller found. But uh, it wasn't until last year that I finally, uh, I met Jeff Manganero who runs Appalachian Gold Fungi he basically helped me learn how to crack the code on how to find cordyceps in the wild. So I went, I went with him to several of his amazing, really abundant cordyceps spots. I mean, just hundreds, I mean, by the thousands really, but I mean, just like wow. walking on the trail, you know, you find hundreds just in, in these places are just, there's a lot of factors that come into this that Jeff has cracked the code on and uh, he'll be publishing some of those ideas. I think we're potentially going to be collaborating on a book. We, have sort of this free exchange sort of deal to where we we sort of keep our most valuable secrets secret together and we know that we can trust each other on that level. And then that helps us to advance. And then we can also share better information with the community as well as a result of that. And I haven't really, there's, you know, there's, there's certain alliances and relationships that you develop over the time, but it's awesome sure. when you cross people that you can develop this level of trust with, even if you've live so far away. You haven't really met each other that often. And that's what's been so cool to follow, honestly, about the whole movement of people developing cultivation techniques for cordyceps and really expanding on the potential of cordyceps militaris over, like you said, the past 10 years, maybe 2013 onward, is it has been this kind of decentralized network of individuals, you know, and knock on wood, but like no huge, huge corporations have gotten involved. There's been no, it's been kind of this cool model of social organization that I'm a big believer in. And I put a lot of faith into that we can eventually do this in so many aspects of our life, but have this decentralized network of people that work together, that kind of share open source because they're passionate, interested in the same thing. And we see these big leaps and bounds advancements that isn't then cut off from the world or created into like barriers of intellectual property. Basically, there's not this huge corporatocracy mindset laid over it. And it sounds like a little bit, that's what you're describing. That's what's always struck me by everyone involved in this. Players like you're just talking about, uh, whether it's, I, I know him as Charlie Seps on, uh, on Instagram yes. and Will Padilla Brown and even folks like Michael Weiss, like yourself. 
everyone's kind of out there exploring and sharing. It's like this awesome cross pollination that doesn't require a central authority or even like a cutthroat economic model to really be successful. And I should say, what made you like fall in love with cordyceps though? What, what was it about them back in 2013 that made you think, oh my God, I need to get involved in this? I mean, what I think is fascinating are, are like the chemical and even just visual signaling processes that occur in nature. Like how, how like a flower hijacks our brain, basically, you know, like these types of things, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah. of course we're talking about a fungi that takes over insects, supposedly, you know, like how much militaris affects the nervous system of insects. I'm not really quite sure. I don't think anybody is quite yet in the same regard as like Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which is like basically the one that gets inside of the nervous system of the ant and gets it to climb up things or whatever. But, you know, I see myself as that ant, so to speak. And so totally. what, what drew me into it, and again, trying to pinpoint the exact moment where I even, they got on my radar that I knew that Cordyceps militaris was a distinct species from Ophiocordyceps sinensis, which is like, you know, the Himalayan Cordyceps. Right. And how that came on my radar, I don't exactly remember, but I like to joke that it was like on December 21st, 2012, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the Mayan <laughs> calendar. Really- and then Jeff and I have a, a joke about Cordy Jesus, because when I came into breeding Cordyceps specifically, it was like my 33rd year on this planet. So it was like my Cordy Christ year. And you were a carpenter. Yeah, it, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, how they get on your radar, you know, I don't really know, but you know, it's definitely taken more and more of my focus as time has gone on, you know, um, having those early successes followed by dismal failure, you know, and like, that's the curve on cordyceps, like just looks like a saw blade, you know, it's just like a zigzag (laughs) because if you're lucky enough to have good success and nowadays you're like, there's a lot more going for you than just luck. You know, like I was having to try to piece together things from like, Chinese YouTube videos and like people in Vietnam and stuff. And without me having the linguistic skills to really break that down. So you're really just trying to watch what they're doing and guess what they're maybe doing. Things like that, you know, like digging. There was uh, this article on the shroomery at the time. It was like Roger Fudd's Cordyceps Militaris Tech or something. And this was, I think it was in 2009 or something that he had some success. And this was down in South America, you know, where he got the genetics probably some trade, you know, from somebody in Europe or Asia or something on the shroomery. But, you know, this was one of the, one of the only things I could find that was written in English that I could piece together some approaches. And then finding good genetics is the other piece of the puzzle because cordyceps degrade in a different way than other fungi. So basically what I'm trying to say, I keep kind of derailing, but you can't take for granted normal techniques for growing mushrooms if you're coming into cordyceps for the first time necessarily. And there's sort of this Dunning-Kruger effect that happens for a lot of people. People assume they can do certain things that work with other fungi and they don't work. Right. right. And I just love that story of going through these arcane manuscripts, a post somewhere, a video in Vietnamese that you're trying to like decipher that really starts building the tech, if you will. That trial and error process, it sounds like for two years, it was kind of a trial and error process of, for you. That speaks to a lot of discipline and commitment and uh, drive to be able to push through that. And man, what a feeling it must have been when you got the, some of the first successful fruitings. Absolutely. It was really awesome. And you know, that's that's the thing for me. Not everybody is the same way to where they can let their passion guide them through. But for me, it's not really been by choice, I guess. It's been out of necessity for my own mental health, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, I don't really have a choice. But, and you know, my mom has kind of always said that if there's something that I really want to do, you know, like I will focus on it and I'll do it. But like, if it's not something I and myself really wants, it's like, it's a struggle. Totally. And so I got to a point in life to where like, I was tired of that struggle and that resistance of not doing what I'm most passionate about. What are those barriers for an individual that stops that from happening? For me, it's, it's a little tough for me to like be, I guess, more compassionate towards people that want to learn this stuff that maybe aren't driven by that same passion that, you know, they're, they're kind of more coming from like, well, should I breed cordyceps? And I'm kind of like, no, because I'd rather people that (laughs) won't take no for an answer be doing this. But at the same time, the other people that maybe have other traumatic things that have happened or or made them less inclined to be driven by that. I don't want to be exclusionary towards them either. There's a fine line with that, but I hope that people can, 
I guess, use me as an avatar for that sort of drive of passion of like, if you want to figure something out, the thing that is the most interesting to you, I can guarantee like nobody has figured that thing out yet. Because your thing that's the most interesting is going to be unique to you and everything that you've derived into your experience from all of the unique things that make you you. No one can do it like you can. Even if it's something you think someone's already kind of doing, no one's going to do it in the exact way you are. So if you're that passionate, you need to just go for it. And it's funny because we were talking about how you self-educated yourself. And this is a, a theme that's coming up a lot now in the context of schools being shut down and people rethinking education. And we're centering on this idea of, yeah, you really do have to follow the thread of what really interests you because otherwise you're not really learning like involuntary learning isn't necessarily the most productive. Luckily, you were able to get out of that mold and hit on something that you loved and just start going down that path. And the results have been magnificent. Now, when we're talking about Cordyceps militaris, just to get in some of the nuts and bolts, because I've got a lot of questions about this and I joked right before the interview started that I look at your page and I don't always know what I'm looking at or what's going on, but it's amazing and it's beautiful. But we're talking about Cordyceps militaris and we're talking about genetics. How much variation is there in that species that we're lumping together as Cordyceps militaris? And then what are you selecting for when it comes to genetic expression in there? So this is a really interesting question for me because the amount of variation that exists within a wild population of an organism, you know, is dictated by the environment that they're in, right? What offspring end up surviving are going to be based on the environment and that offspring's ability to adapt to that situation, you know? So sure. when you start taking something that normally does that in the wild and has its own rigorous selection process through those environmental situational parameters, and you put it into a lab environment, the whole selection process changes, right? For Cordyceps militaris, when it comes to like fruiting it on rice media, let's say, there's a huge amount of variation in how these things are going to perform in their first generation on an artificial media. It's a fascinating subject for me because it's like, let's say I run 20 different you know, single ascospore pairings on rice media that I've came up with in my head, or I have had relative success with growing cordyceps before, and I run all 20 of those, I might end up only with three or four, or maybe one or two that I think have what it takes to really do well in a commercial situation. And again, I'm only evaluating those strains for the situation and parameters that I'm giving to it. You know, so like right. there might be a couple that don't perform well that like if I had changed a couple variables, they might have been a better selection. So there's a huge amount of variation. It also depends on the stock that you're breeding from, like whether it's coming from the wild or whether it's coming from something that's grown on a rice media before. And then also with cordyceps, there's this other dynamic to where there's a lot of mutation that occurs. And then there's also mm -hmm. a lot of parasitic organisms that actually endophytically sort of live with the cordyceps you have to also select for resistance to these pathogens and sort of develop workarounds for basically their own natural self-destruct mechanisms. I would imagine the biggest way to introduce genetic variability are those wild specimens. But it's interesting to think that these organisms kind of are so fast moving or fast adapting that you have mutations within generations of working with them in the lab. Even within Petri dish transfers of each other. You can have an isolate that just it just gets overrun with this weirdest white, like fluffy stuff that is just very problematic. So maintaining cordyceps genetics is basically my full-time job. Is that unique to cordyceps? I mean, that mutation and that maybe Petri to Petri transfer, is that different than other fungi it's you've worked with? It's different than most other basidiomycetes, you know, because it's an ascomycete and uh, they just have sure. a very different way of their DNA is just not as stable, I guess. And then also, like I said, with a parasitic organism like that, and of course, like this, this word parasite gets tossed around, but it's, it's like kind of a gray area for me because there's huge ecological niche that they're obviously fulfilling. And there obviously is a reason for them to exist. And also these regulating mechanisms that I'm talking about, they prevent these things from decimating insect populations in the wild. You know, like right. there's, they don't really survive well above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. They just start getting overrun with all kinds of mutated expression and parasites and stuff when you bring them above that temperature range. 
you know, a lot of people joke about what if they evolve to like infect humans? And it's like, well, there's already shit that does that. So, <laughs> so we don't have to, we don't have to wonder too much, but I love that idea that something that might be called a parasite has a specific purpose that it's adapted to. And we should, probably should be thankful in some way that it's regulating the population of that organism. And yeah, that idea of cordyceps evolving to take over humans, God has that pervaded mushroom culture. And then even popular culture, when you bring up cordyceps or just explain to people what they do, the first reaction is, oh, like what if that evolved to, you know, take over humans or that's kind of the joke. Yeah, you're saying that are, that already exists out there. It already exists. And this is one of the things that I feel is probably one of our best defenses <laughs> against a lot of human pathogens, you know? And actually there's a clinical trial starting, a phase one clinical trial in India right now using cordyceps militaris as adjunct therapy for COVID-19. So that's super exciting. Wow. And, you know, there's already a lot of promising antiviral research about it, about what it does for the kidneys, what it does for the heart, what it does for the lungs. So, I mean, this is it seems like a pretty perfect fit. So it's really nice to see that there's potentially going to be some science to back that up coming up pretty soon. Okay. So cordyceps might not be the thing that caused the zombie fungus apocalypse. They actually might save us from it. That's, I love that. Yeah. Now there's a word you brought up there that I want to just lay out here and kind of expose my own ignorance, but what is a single ascospore isolate? Because I know that's kind of your starting point. And then maybe we can flow into a discussion of how you actually then breed these unique strains. Awesome. Well, I'll try not to make it compellingly obvious that my degree is in music. So <laughs> basically an ascospore is uh, what we call a cordyceps spore. It's, it's how they, they sexually reproduce. So when we have two single ascospores of opposite mating type, or we, we call them idiomorphs as well. So they have sexes as well. Basically, there are two different mating types in cordyceps militaris which means they're a bipolar heterothallic fungus. And so it takes two spores of opposite mating type in order to produce a parathesial stromata, which is basically the little tiny dimples that are on the ends of the stroma are technically the fruiting bodies. Okay, so, interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Again, I'm, I'm not really a biologist or even classically trained mycologist, so um, sometimes I'm a bit out of my depth when it comes to... Uh, but already it's diverging from like some of the basics of mycology 101, including just the fact that there's only two types of spores. For cordyceps militaris, there's only two. Again, that's kind of unique because one of the things that gets thrown around is like, oh, well, mushrooms have, you know, sometimes tens of thousands of different genders or sexes. So that's interesting. There's only two. Only two, yeah. So that's like male and female. Yeah. Sort of. Well, what's also interesting is they don't have any sort of morphological differences outright that you can see. So if you're skilled enough to run gel electrophoresis, you know, you can, you can run the DNA and you can look for these things, but I don't have a lab personally. Um, that's something I haven't uh, Not done. yet. Yeah, personally. Yeah. When I get the new terrestrial fungi facility, you know, I work out of my home. That's another thing a lot of people that, that write me asking to tour my facility and stuff don't realize is that I work out of my basement laundry room and a couple bedrooms in my house, you know, so um that also goes to show what's possible, you know, nowadays, you right. know, on a level, like what you're able to accomplish. Yeah. So then how are you isolating? I don't want to give away like state secrets or, you know, the way you yeah, kind of do I'm things, here. but you know, I, I'm the type of person that I'm like within reason, you know, it's like, sure. I, I like being open source, but then, you know, I also like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for people that have that passion that like, you know, maybe they, they deserve to kind of get ahead because they're willing to go the extra step to, you know, find out the details. So as far as isolating the spores, I either collect spores from wild specimens or okay. cultivated specimens. Um, the wild specimens are problematic because they tend to have other things growing with them. They're more prone to having some of the other parasites that like to parasitize cordyceps, which is interesting, a parasite on a parasite, but it also <laughs> goes to show like how we choose in our relationships, like has its own karmic effects, sort of, I feel like. Cordyceps can't decimate its food completely in the wild. So there have to be those regulating mechanisms, you know, to take it out. Right. So I collect the spores by discharging them onto Petri dishes with uh, water agar. And then I use the microscope basically to verify their singularity, um, which the a cordyceps ascospore, I should have mentioned before, is made up of, of 128 part spores. So they look like kind of like this zigzag line with mm -hmm. all of 
dots, you know, kind of along it. And they can break into pieces and other things like that. So you have like eight of these stuffed into this little thing on the end of, uh, you know, the fruiting body and they discharge, they like explode out and they shoot out, I think kind of like springs, you know, they're, they're really interesting. They look a lot different than other mushroom spores. They look like this sort of like zigzag chain. Oh, of super interesting. And then like once they germinate, they look like a centipede. They just got like all of these hyphae just like shooting all out this line, you know, and obviously the line shape is probably ideal for if it lands, you know, vertically along a caterpillar's body, it can just... Sure. <laughs> and that's the other thing that's fascinating is we don't really even know how these things infect their hosts in the wild and like what exactly their ecology is and how that all plays out, you know, and obviously they have more hosts than in a lot of different species of entomopathogenic fungi. Wow, that's that's a huge question. How Cordyceps militaris actually infects the bug, you know, from landing as a zigzag spore chain to actually taking it over the bug. It has to be in their gut, you know, and it probably depends on the species of caterpillar, you know, like I said. And then, and then there's distinct differences between the populations in Europe as well as in the populations in, in North America. And what's really cool is you can follow kind of like the mountain chain that used to be the Appalachians and before that split in Pangaea. And you can see populations of cordyceps like similarly in, you know, those same geological sort of places, which is fascinating too. Some biogeography in there. And, you know, you're laying out probably a little bit of that evolutionary history too, why it has the physical structure that it does, at least in its spores, how that probably evolved. I'm sure this is probably a field though, like you said, with a lot of big unanswered questions that people <laughs> could start looking into. I think we're just like scratching the surface of some huge unanswered questions about a fungi that is poised to uh, take center stage here for the next couple of decades. It's quickly becoming and probably is the most researched currently medicinal mushroom. It's hot. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I and that's, you know, what strikes me too about a lot of the people like yourself that are into this, you were doing it before it was such a big thing. You know, I, I would imagine there'd be this like cordyceps gold rush that may be coming as people try to get into this. So it's nice to know that there are some like true keepers of the cordyceps knowledge that aren't just in it for the money. Yeah, I appreciate that, you know, because I would be doing this. It's like last year, I, I took a major loss breeding cordyceps, <laughs> you know, like wow. that's I did not get a mortgage this year because <laughs> because of my <laughs> breeding. Um, so, you know, that's the thing. It's like a lot of people might see outwardly what I'm doing, but right. you know, it's easy to to envy somebody's results of what they've done. But like when you look at the lifestyle or you look at the the sacrifices of what that takes to actually commit yourself to doing that, you know, and that's the other thing that I really appreciate about people that are, you know, willing to support my work through growing my genetics and and putting it out there, like especially reciprocating by like tagging me when they grow my genetics, you know, and that's the other thing, you know, you talked about intellectual property and, and those types of things. So it's like, there is a lot of sort of like open source mentality in the mushroom community, which is ultimately a good thing, but like there's a difference between like an unsustainable open source mentality and a sustainable open source mentality. Totally. And that's sort of where I talk about like when it comes to like being a private researcher, on fungi, it's like, no, I don't tell everybody everything about like how I do what I do. Like I, that'd be against my own self-interest in so many ways. But again, if I see somebody is really passionate about it and I see like maybe like A, B, and C, like maybe C is missing, like I'll give them a hint or I'll, you know, I'll drop them a line straight up, you know? So it really just depends. And I evaluate people's understanding of reciprocity as well, you know, and like reciprocity is a huge part of sustainability. So yeah. for me, like that's, that's been huge about like what I've been trying to build. And it's like, there's no law against somebody reselling genetics that they got from me, you know, and ultimately if they're in that situation to where that's what they need to do to survive, like that's great. But I also think there's ways that we can carve all of this out in a cooperative fashion. And obviously yeah. I'm not perfect in that regard either, you know, and I get jealous of people or I get, you know, like judge people for maybe their grows aren't as good as mine or something, you know, but it's hard as, as an artist or like somebody that, you know, likes to perfect things. It's like, that's the lens you see the world through, you know, is like through with a critical eye, you know, but for the most part, I, I love what people are doing out there. You're hinting at some like big psychological underpinnings that a lot of us, I think, have come face to face with. And this concept of reciprocity is a huge one. And it was one of my questions was, is there some kind of like, I, I know at first, when I was saying that, I was like this altruistic worldview of like, no one's having intellectual property protections. But, you know, some of the guiding 
impetus behind something like intellectual property is a desire to see reciprocity embodied, you know, to make sure that, you know, I am getting credit for this unique thing that I put out in the world. And yeah, if you want to resell it, that's great. But we all kind of instinctively know I should probably get a little piece of that because I was the one that did all the hard work to birth it out of the ether and create it. There is like a, a fundamental good impetus behind something like intellectual property. But is that something you could even do with fungi? I mean, I thought you couldn't. I personally, I can, I can barely like fill out paperwork and like get my taxes done, you know? So it's, it, you know, <laughs> you're not when, filing a patent application. When people like, I've seen people even like put it out there in the community and be like, oh, well, we're not going to file, we're not going to file a patent for this. And we're just going to share it with everybody and had people just like patting them on the backs. And it's just like, were you really able one to patent it or two, were you actually going to go through that? Because I personally would rather grow mushrooms and like experiment with things growing in jars and stuff than like sit filing paperwork. So I personally, like, I tend to try to invest in sort of like a different mentality that's not necessarily scarcity based. If people want to like live off of my scraps, so to speak, I mean, there's plenty to go around, hopefully, you know, and like, that's why I, I do this. That's why I try to improve myself so that other people can benefit from that. Of course, what I'm doing hopefully is like a foundation for other people, you know, to like kind of take that torch and be very successful. And I think that's specifically kind of how you position your business, terrestrial fungi, is that you're like powering cordyceps farmers and you're powering other people with these really potent genetics. So I think it all comes together in a really holistic way. But that is a big concept that I think I would wrestle with if I was creating these unique genetics is, man, how do I make sure that someone isn't going to start putting these on a farm, making them, cloning them out? And that's a huge question. And, you know, maybe this is something that lawyers who are more well-versed in the law will, will wrestle over. But just back to the playing with jars part, that's kind of where I am too. Get us back to where we started with our zigzag lines of ascospores. Is it as simple as just placing the two different mating types together in a petri dish are there errors that come into play there i think that's that's a perfect place to start sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah perfect there because like a lot of people you know they'll do their pairings on a petri dish and they'll try to observe for like a line of resistance or whatever between the two colonies but like that for me has not proven to be a reliable way at all to determine if something is going to fruit well on substrate you know wow. so for yeah. me I put all of the ascospore isolates that I've grown out and I put those all in their own liquid culture. That way I can actually pair them on the fruiting substrate. And that way I can run hundreds of different possibilities of pairings with a certain number of, like if I had 13 bottles of liquid culture with 13 different isolates, I could have 78 different pairings that are unique. So just to make sure I'm understanding, you're able to take just that one ascospore isolate and it doesn't have to match with another spore to start creating mycelium mass. Right, exactly. It grows out as as its own uh, a haploid. So it's, it's a haploid culture, basically, that it won't produce parathesial stromata on its own. But it will turn orange like a normal cordyceps culture will. Um, it'll colonize rice. It'll do, you know, do everything. Some of them will produce these sterile blob-like forms, but they won't produce like the pretty parathesial stromata. Wow. So you can have just the one side of that equation creating mycelium mass and creating. Yeah. And I like, have certain ice structure that like I like. They pair really well when I cross things to them. And like they've been paired with hundreds of different other isolates from either the wild or cultivated things that I always kind of use these uh, sort of wheelhouse isolates to sort of test everything, you know. And so I mentioned the mating types and how there, there is like 50% compatibility, right? Right. So. Basically, if I had those 78 and there were 13 brand new ascospores and I didn't know the mating type or whatever, then pretty much 50% of those would be compatible. So I'd end up with, what's that, 35, 37 fruiting pairings, basically, approximately, you know, of those, you know, I'd probably end up with maybe five or six that I would probably carry forward. And, and, and that criteria would be based on how it performs on the fruiting substrate maybe even flavor of the fruiting bodies. I don't, here in the States, we don't have a lot of access to testing for active metabolites like cordycepin and adenosine, but you know, that might be part of the criteria eventually in the future. But, you know, also right. I think a lot of the industry has kind of gotten tunnel vision in that regard. And you can see how it's sort of 
skewed the market. And a lot of people in India, like they can't sell cordyceps that they've grown because people have these high standards for like one molecule that we don't really know how bioavailable that is when it's at a high level or like, you know, how the body processes it differently. You know, so these are things that I, you know, I'm not opposed to, you know, high cordyceps and strains and those types of things, but I also don't want to skew the industry here towards that specifically until we really know more about it. Classic kind of reductionist pitfall, I think, that you exactly. see in a lot of different areas. And just thinking in the realm of mushrooms, it's happening right now with psilocybin, right? That's like the big focus is on that one molecule when there are probably a lot of other adjunctive molecules. And it sounds like the same is probably true for cordyceps. And now, so you have your wheelhouse of strains that you're familiar with. You know what properties generally they're going to impart, but how reliable is it to know kind of what you're going to get out of a child of a pairing? You know, do the properties pass on pretty reliably? Is it still kind of a gamble? You know, it still seems like a little bit of a gamble because with cordyceps, there's those other factors that come into play with just maintaining a clean culture, you know? So aside from the properties that the the fruiting bodies are going to have, you also have the properties that the parents have as far as their propensity to be vulnerable to these parasites and mutating. Right. So it tends to be a little bit difficult to track, you know, like I've done some Punnett squares and, and played around with tracking recessive traits and, and those types of things, but that hasn't proven to be super practical for me in what I'm doing, at least with the infrastructure that I have and the scale of the laboratory that I have. Like maybe if I had, you know, lab assistants and I was just having them run thousands of pairings versus hundreds, then that would probably come into play. Or, you know, when, when I'm a little bit more organized and there are specific recessive traits that I know that I want to bring out, that'll definitely be something I sort of go down. But now it's really just about connecting with the ones that really speak to me, you know, as far as their forms, because I think that that language right there is like very powerful. And I think it's really important. Wow. So you're resonating with certain species and just thinking like a little more intuitively, it sounds like, of blending what cultures are going to maybe match up with some of the guys, again, that you've got in the wheelhouse that you know a little bit more about. You know, and this is one of the things that my memory actually works really well for is like remembering what mating type like a particular isolate is. And of course, I have like an an Excel chart where I'm like, okay, double red number three. I know that off the top of my head, that's a a mat one one mating type, whereas my mountain four number four I know is mat one two, which is respectively like male and female, so to speak. Right, right. Anytime I you know, I'm testing new, like I've got all these new wild isolates that I collected this season, you know, and I've just got like hundreds of Petri dishes of all these isolates. I think I found about 33 specimens this season. It was like a really dry season. And so I didn't go out a lot, especially earlier in the season. And uh, from all of those, I tried to collect spores from like whatever looks viable by the time I get the samples home, you know, and then Mm. whatever is sort of like already dropping heavily by the time I look at everything to print then that's the ones that I sort of choose. So I try to get like 10 to 30 spores from each specimen. I mean, then I just select the ones that look the best initially and I'll keep those all around and I can eventually go back to those and and sort of manage them and rework them. And definitely reworking them later is a lot more work because they've been taken over by parasites and other things like that by the time I get to them, so. Yeah, and so you would get maybe some isolate spores from that wild specimen. You would grow that out on a substrate yeah, right. after pairing them with with you know a variety of other you know spores or whatever, and then from there I select, I'll cross the new ones basically to a mat one one and a mat one two strain respectively. So that way, sure. when they form fruiting bodies, I know what mating type they are. Now, if I had a lab, I could just test the cultures for the mating type. But the reason that I don't use that as a shortcut is like I feel like it would just be another step added to having to fruit everything out. It, I mean, it would save me having to fruit out half of the pairings that don't fruit, but it's still not going to tell me how they perform on fruiting substrate, essentially. Right. You know, I just go to that extra step instead of running the DNA analysis. Not to say I, I have the ability to do that yet, but I think <laughs> I can probably figure, figure that out. What I'm struck by is this process. I was getting ready for like a really complicated where there's DNA analysis being done. But what I really like is how approachable this is. You know, John Henry, it's like, the DNA analysis is the steam locomotive or hammering in the <laughs> the railroad or whatever. And I'm still trying to John Henry it, I guess. And maybe it's because I'm I'm 34. So I'm not I'm just above a millennial as far as my understanding of 
going to that next step. So I'm still sort of a dinosaur when it comes to my breeding approach. <laughs> well, and there may be other virtues to it. Like you're saying, it may, it may actually tell you some information just by that John Henry swinging the pickaxe. You might actually get some other useful information that you wouldn't get just from applying it to DNA analysis. Well, I appreciate the run through of that process. Like I said, for me, it's always been a little bit, you know, when you look at your page, you're not afraid to throw out like the names of the strains, which are obviously coded with letters and numbers that mean something to you in terms of, you know, the mating type and the strain. But I'm always a little bit like, what does that mean? So I appreciate you kind of walking through that and laying that out. What's been a big surprise or a successful pairing that stands out to you that you really didn't expect? Uh, the strain that I, I released a few weeks ago, I actually, it's already pretty much aged out. So, I mean, some people are going to have some really great success with it. Some people might not. It's, it's a fickle, beautiful thing, but it's called dendrite. Basically, it just, it grows these amazing forms that are just like moose antler, like hands or like fans with like multiple fingers. They just, it's absolutely beautiful. At least the first run was absolutely beautiful. I've got some on the second run right now that are showing some similarities, but not quite as perfect as the first run. But I'll get it, I'll get it running again and I'll re-release it too. That's the thing with with all these strains, like they can kind of wave in and out of being like releasable or not based on their right. capacity for housing this sort of parasitic expression. So the dendrite is definitely one of the coolest strains of cordyceps, but it's a sterile strain. It doesn't produce parathesia. Mm. So it can't produce spores, so you can't continue breeding that, you know, variety. And yeah. actually a lot of strains in Asia are released specifically. They're sold as sterile strains and they're expensive. I mean, that you can pay 250 to 350 for a sterile strain. USD, you know, you can't actually produce your own strains from it. Whereas, you know, like the, the strains we're producing here in the US, we're releasing for the most part. I mean, if I have a sterile strain, I release it that way as a sterile strain. But for the most part, all the strains that I release are fertile and you can produce. I mean, there are some strains that I've produced amazing commercial strains from just like a single stroma off of a wild clone, you know? So wow. it really just takes very little genetic material. It only takes like one success, one poor success of like a weird looking fruit, as long as there's parathesia on it and you can get spores from it. Like you can do a lot with cordyceps because again, they adapt really fast. You know, so even if like you're kind of running them through the ringer with your techniques, if you're able to get them bred for a few generations, you know, that might be hard if you can't even grow them well for one generation. <laughs> right. Technically, I mean, you can, you can find a way. I'm seeing this sawtooth pattern emerge. I mean, even in just keeping a reliable stock of genetics, sounds like it would be a lot of work just to maintain the strains that you know and love that you want to work with. Sounds like there'd be even some challenges in just managing that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a funny question I also get, you know, from people that are maybe interested in breeding and they're like, well, how many pairings do I run or whatever? And it's just like, I'd recommend if you're going to do this, like you'd be the kind of person where like, there's not a number that's going to satisfy you. You know, <laughs> you're interested in this, right? Like, what if you run 70 and like, what would that 71st have looked like? For me, like I would be wondering, you know, I wouldn't be focused on like, oh, well, I've got a figure this out so that I can have my own genetics to be self-sustaining growing cordyceps when at the same time, like I'm out there, like trying to get strains from Jeff or try to get strains from William, try to get strains from Weiss, you know, like we sent me some stuff this year to work with because he's not like actively breeding really right now, but he still wants to see that stuff move forward. I can't get enough of it. I have genetics from over a dozen different countries trying wow. to check in off the list, you know? Well, and this is a joke that I use with a lot of people who are into like any kind of wild mushroom strain, but it starts feeling like Pokemon. Like you just mm -hmm. got to go out and collect them all. And that's what I think we need to like kind of utilize the things that we were hijacked with growing up and like reframe the way that we see nature. How much more interesting are these real organisms that we live with than Pokemon? You totally. know, the way that we relate to that is through some other thing that we should be connecting to, but we were... As, and I think about that, like, you know, people talk about Cheetos when it comes to cordyceps. And it's just right. like, look how hijacked we've become because something that normally would have caught our eye in nature or whatever, it's like that has been hijacked by the Cheeto. You know, Cheeto why looks like cordyceps, not the other way around. Exactly. Cheetos look like cordyceps, not the other way around. <laughs> I like that perspective. I like your perspective about these things. And then, you know, we've talked a lot about cordyceps because that's something that's really fascinating. I know a lot of people are, are going to be interested in this. And I know a lot of my listeners probably know your work and wanted to know 
all that detail. And that's awesome. But I also love your Ganoderma. And I mean, you're wearing the shirt with the big, beautiful Ganoderma on it. But what, and it doesn't have to be chronological, but like, how did Ganoderma come into the sphere? I guess you're just working with genetics, you're working with cultivating. Ganoderma are beautiful. Why not do that too? Yeah. So, I mean, Ganoderma were kind of on the radar before Cordyceps. And I remember I was still living with my parents and I was in college and they went to a health food store and there was an older guy. He used to go around to all the health food stores and he was like a Gano coffee representative, you know, like those companies that make the Ganoderma coffee or whatever. And this was, yeah. this was before like the big mushroom boom or whatever, you know, like, so it was still a little bit more obscure or whatever. I remember they got me some of this Ganoderma coffee, you know, cause I was sort of into herbs and stuff and just like, you know, gardening and growing mint and that kind of stuff. And that's what I really remember, like Ganoderma first coming into my sort of sphere of understanding and what this mushroom of immortality or whatever was, you know. And then uh, it was early on that I was cultivating that I ended up getting a Ganoderma culture. And I don't remember if it was a freebie from everything mushrooms or spore works or something, but I ended up growing that out in like a, a six quart Rubbermaid shoebox container, you know, on sawdust or whatever. And I totally fell in love with that first grow and just seeing that grow. That was actually a Ganoderma lingji. You know, they have it on their website as Ganoderma lucidum, but I had a sequence later and based on its features, it's actually Ganoderma lingji. And so that's the other thing that really is fascinating about Ganoderma. It's like this other new frontier of taxonomic. Um, it's basically a taxonomic nightmare because of how it's been represented in history and in books and stuff without people fully understanding the nuance of the different differences between the different species. Um, right. So generally they're the same, but the most me historically used Ganoderma medicinally is Ganoderma lingi, which okay. most people miscorrectly call Ganoderma lucidum. Now Ganoderma lucidum was originally discovered in, uh, in the UK and it's actually more closely related to Ganoderma suge, which grows here in the United States, Ganoderma oregonense, which grows in the United States as well. It also has some relatives in Europe, Ganoderma carnosum, Ganoderma blessiasum. And then Ganoderma lingi is actually more closely related to Ganoderma curtisii, which is our Ganoderma we find in the Southern United States. A lot of times people call it lucidum, you know, incorrectly, but there was a study that I participated in a few years ago. This was, again, it's not chronological. I'm kind of bouncing all over the place. Right. A few years ago, I helped collect samples. I sent over a hundred different samples uh, or Ganoderma strains from the wild and commercial strains I collected from people in Europe, people in, in Asia, like all over the place. Um, and I sent those to Dr. Robert Blanchett at the University of Minnesota. And he and many other people, also Matt Schenk was on that study, a friend of mine. They uh, basically created the study. It was called Elucidating Lucidum. And it's all about distinguishing between the different species of Ganoderma here in the United States. With that study, we also discovered that Ganoderma martinisensi grows here, which before then had only been seen in uh, the French colonial island Martinique uh, in the Caribbean. So we found that it actually occurs down in like Alabama and Tennessee and some other places like that. But yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of like I used that study as an excuse to really expand my collection, but I was also just obsessed with Ganoderma and I was growing a lot of Ganoderma and that's how I got connected with Dr. Blanchett. Are you working then with all these different strains? Because obviously this study introduced you to like the huge, wide, diverse world of Rishi and I'm just kind of getting my bearings in that world but are you then working with all these strains and do these different strains actually, are they able to be interbred? That's another great question. And so uh, Ganoderma, it's instead of being bipolar, it's actually tetrapolar. So like there's actually even less compatibility when it comes to the mating, the spores. So you're right. really, for every single spore is only going to be compatible with a quarter of the other spores that are present. So like when fungi do this, it's because they're trying to increase the chances of outcrosses happening in the wild. So if you have something that's homothallic, like some sort of mold or something that just doesn't need that to happen, it's like self-fertile. It doesn't do any outcrossing, you know, so there's no sort of genetic exchange from other colonies. Now, if you have cordyceps, you have 50% of compatibility, you have a little bit of a chance of that outcrossing happening. And then with something like Ganoderma, you have even more of a chance, but there's other things that just have outrageous amounts of mating types or whatever to increase those chances of outcrossing happening. And then across these different species, suge, organensi, are you yeah, able to then so, breed across those? 
Zugain, organensi, lucidum, carnosum, blessiasum, those are all in what we call the Ganoderma lucidum clade. And so they all match DNA like 99%. So those all most likely can be bred. Now, there have been some, some studies that looked at this type of crossbreeding with Ganoderma, but they didn't have the real lucidum when they, like, you know, when they describe the mushroom that they're using, they, they actually overlooked like some very key details. Mm. So there were certain things like where people maybe tried some of this stuff. The other thing about Ganoderma is they have a very low germination rate. Basically, in order to get isolates and in order to find compatibility, like you have a way larger scale issue than you do with cordyceps. You need a lot of chances. You need a lot of petri dishes. You need, you know, so you, you use, basically you use a technique called spore dilution. And so you're taking a certain amount of spores, you're adding it to water and you're increasing the volume of water until you get the concentration of spores that you want to spread them out across a plate. And then you're observing for germination and then potentially isolating those spores. So then the other problem with Ganoderma is that the spores are a lot smaller than ascospores. They're more so the size of like a part spore. So like the ascospores are a lot easier to see. They're a lot easier to pick up. I mean, Ganoderma is very difficult to breed in general. I've had very, uh, very minimal success when it comes to working with Ganoderma as far as single spore. But, you know, multi-spore can work. But again, you're, you're fighting against contamination usually from them being in a sort of wet environment that's like prolonged, you know, over the course of a longer growing season than a lot of other mushrooms. So in short, <laughs> Ganoderma that are of the same clade, they most likely can crossbreed. And that's something yeah. that I'm working on, I'm working on the Lucidum clade. I have actually Lucidum sensu stricto doesn't strictly grow in the US. Like I said, it's a European species, but we do have two populations in California and Utah of Lucidum. So I have I have collections of California, Utah, some from France, and then I have Ganoderma carnosum from Europe as well, Valesiasum from Germany. So like this is something that I'm I have the breeding stock for, but don't quite have the infrastructure or facilities to to fully keep up with, you know, my ambition in that regard, but it's coming. Right. Well, and actually, that's a great place to talk about then where terrestrial fungi is now and what you set the intention for terrestrial fungi to be in the future. Like you said, you've got the breeding stock, and I'm really impressed by the way you've been able to source specimens, I mean, from all over the planet, from your own wild collections, networking with other people. And, you know, at the end, maybe we can give out a couple of resources for people to get potentially spores and cultures and things that you found a lot of success with. But I guess, where is terrestrial fungi now in terms of infrastructure, team, all that good stuff? And then, you know, where do you want to be in the not too distant future, or maybe the distant future? So as of right now, I'm a, a one-man team with occasional help from my fiance, Heather. She is super talented and she runs a website called rusticrosette.com as well. So she's multi-talented. You know, she makes soap, she makes clothing. She's also a really talented belly dance instructor or dance instructor, I should say, all types of dance, including belly dance and you know, for the last like 20 years. Wow. And so I have help from her. And then also like I couldn't, I work from home, so I couldn't not include her as part of the team because she has to deal with the cacophony that is running an ever expanding mushroom business from your house, you know? And like, that's the other thing. Like I didn't go to business school. Like I didn't build this from like a business plan, you know, like this is sure. just, all me, you know, like I wake up in the morning and think about what I'm doing. And then, you know, like I've pretty much cleared my schedule most days so that like I can just be at the whim of the fungi. So right now I'm working from home out of limited space and I enjoy the aspects of, uh, you know, working from home. I couldn't really do it any other way because of my obsession and just the sort of the nature of the way that I work. So the goal is for, you know, homestead property being on a little bit more land so I can upscale some of these processes eventually right. hopefully producing mushrooms myself one day because I think I'm pretty good at growing them. But for now, it's been about supplying those genetics to other farmers. And I get jealous sometimes, you know, like when I see people growing this really amazing stuff that I've, you know, collected over so many years and, you know, like it's finally growing at scale somewhere. Like I get jealous, but I know that I've played a, <laughs> an important role in that happening. But I, I'm coming for you, farmers, I guess is what I should say. <laughs> He's going to go from proud, distant father to raising these little fungi <laughs> babies on his own. I've got to micromanage them, you know, it's, uh, it's, you get attached. But sure. yeah, I mean, eventually that's like, I'd like to be growing these things at scale. You know, I've avoided 
taking in investors and stuff. Like this is all yeah. my own you know, sort of baby as far as financially too. I mean, I'm, I'm all on the line. I don't have an LLC or anything. I mean, this is just pretty much, I run like a DBA as terrestrial fungi. So, I mean, I've, I've got everything invested into this. I just like to expand to the next step and be producing, you know, some quantity of medicine and then also like doing extractions in house. Like that's what I really see. And I see this we need to upscale this whole industry here in order to keep up with the products that are available on the Asian market. I mean, the, the dual extract powders and stuff that are available like in Asia are second to none. And so as much as I love promoting like the American products and stuff and the things that we're doing here now, we got to grow a lot more mushrooms. Yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover. And frankly, a lot of the emerging demand is here. So it would make sense that there would be a homegrown industry. And I talked about it before, and, and I'll use my chance to get on a soapbox again, but I love this idea of decentralized producers and that it doesn't have to be one giant mushroom and extraction factory somewhere. As much as we've kind of moved our economic system in that model of centralized means of production in one place, have people ship everything into that one place and produce it. I think there are a lot of virtues that get lost, not the least of which spreading the actual economic benefit from having producers do the whole process as individuated units that aren't directly centralized throughout the, the country. And I think that model has a lot of merit and it sounds like that would be very much, and I mean, for you, it's kind of perfect because for you, it's a lifestyle. It's not a business. Like, well, that's, I think I was going to touch on that as well with what you're saying, because, you know, like if you're going to take on that production yourself, again, like for me, this is more, this is more of like a spiritual relationship that I have with fungi than it is about anything else. You know, it's not a commodity oriented relationship that's based on like, I'm taking this thing that somebody else grew that is basically no different than a pill or a pharmaceutical. It's, right. it's, it's not really from that same sort of paradigm. It's so much more than that. I mean, that's the promise of fungi, right? On this like much higher level is that it will break us free from that paradigm. And that's why I like this idea that the cordyceps doesn't respond always to trying to fit it into like neat, repeatable processes where you know exactly what you're going to get. And it's just like scaling it up will lead to this standardized type of cordyceps. Like, no, it might not work like that. It might actually like throw you off and not fit into that mold. And I think you are someone who has that mindset that can use it to kind of push us out of this paradigm that I think is chewing a lot of us up. Yeah. I mean, granted, you know, like I have to commend a lot of those virtues that we've been afforded through, you know, the paradigms that we've existed within, right, you know, like, right. well, I'm all about, you know, the whole phrase of transcend and include, we have to include all of the good parts of the scientific method and let go of all of the, the BS that we've been given and, and the ways that it's been hijacked, you know, yeah. like certain things like, you know, somebody will test the mammalian toxicity of glyphosate and say it's, it's safe to spray on our crops as a pre-harvest desiccant just because it has low mammalian toxicity, not factoring in how it's affecting the bacteria in our guts, how, not factoring how it's changing the phytic acid levels of the wheat that they're spraying it on. Like, you know, so like this, again, reductionistic application of science, like that's the dangerous part. Maybe I'm not going to uh, articulate this the best way, but it's like, I think, again, we have to mimic nature through our hypothesis process, you know, and then use the scientific method as best we can to explain why that works. But I think it's all laid out for us for the most part. Mine and, and Jeff's successes as far as breeding cordyceps have been from observing the environment that they grow in. And then, of course, reading lots of studies and, and, you know, we're really grateful that that work has been done in, in so many regards. Like, how many things could we be focusing on that there aren't studies for? Post range of Cordyceps militaris in the United States is very, very poorly documented. There's still so, and that's like what, what's really exciting about this. There are places that you can carve out niches that nobody has gone into. Yeah, there's still tons of room for exploration. It's always what... I love about mushrooms is how much more there is to learn, how much room there is for people to get involved and start exploring, start discovering, ask questions that seem like way outside the norm that actually end up being super relevant. I often ascribe this like paradigm busting property to mushrooms. I kind of love what you said there, which is like, we can honor what's come before and then not bring all of it with us because it doesn't really serve us anymore. Keep building and reincorporating and building 
this new future. And I had a feeling that would be your mindset. I had a feeling that was your vibe, but I love hearing you elucidate it. I think it's, I think it's really powerful. In that vein, do you have advice for anyone who wants to get into this work? I guess step one, lose yourself in the fungi and don't wait for <laughs> permission. There is no dress rehearsal, get into this thing. But do you have any advice for anyone who wants to start working with fungi? I mean, you've laid out, you're able to do what is this kind of high level breeding work at home. So yeah. advice for people out there, um, obviously you can't give an exhaustive list of every resource, everything, but just some some words of wisdom. Yeah. Um is this advice for people that are just getting into mushroom growing or is this people that are growing mushrooms that want to get into breeding? Like, That's a good delineation. Let's say people who already have a familiarity with mushrooms have done some cultivation at home. How can they kind of then go to this stage of breeding and start selecting their, their own strains and kind of go to that level? Yeah. So, I mean, the first step to breeding anything is just, you know, run multi-spore cultures from things that you threw out that you have spores forming from, you know, and try to notice what happens when you grow from those things. And like, what I find is most fascinating is like the concept of epigenetics that like how we're treating certain genetic material is going to change the expression over time, you know? So like the perfect application for breeding, like let's say you've got a, a material, like a waste material or something, like maybe in your area, you have an easier time finding softwoods or something like that, you know, and like, you can't really find genetics that are performing very well on your chosen substrate, or maybe you get some hardwood fuel pellets that are like partially softwood. And like, you got screwed on like a pallet of fuel pellets and you've got to find food for it. I mean, most commercial producers aren't going to have a lot of time to be doing breeding, you know, and that's like, I guess why, why I try to fit myself in, you know, as far as make myself useful by committing all of my time to that process versus right. being in a process of commercial production. So that's the other thing. Make sure that it's it's a practical use of your time in your financial situation or um, in your situation of infrastructure. Because the reason I offer strains of cordyceps is because it's not really practical for most people that want to be producing to be hunting through all these strains and running all these jars that aren't producing well and different things like that. So yeah, definitely focus on on what you're you want out of it and uh, kind of adjust accordingly from there. But try to focus on producing quality as far as like if instead of just producing to sell genetics or something, try to offer something that's unique or you know out of a high quality for sure. Like I think that's very important. And even just if if you're starting out and you're you're trying to like offer up genetics on your website and stuff like that. You know, I see people selling strains with stock photos that who knows where they got the photo and, and things like that. And, and that's cool if that's what you've got to do, but it really speaks volumes of like how long you've been doing this. And like, I always tell people to be weary of people that are only using stock photos because if the person hasn't grown the strain enough to have photos of it that they're proud of, like, I mean, how well is it going to perform? Is it what they say that it is, you know? And of course, if you're paying $10 for some of the stuff, it doesn't really matter, I guess. So it really just depends on where on where you're at and what you want out of it. And I don't think it's hierarchical, but everybody has their own personal way of approaching things. All of us inevitably have some hierarchy of quality or something that we're looking for in our head. And just from your own experience, I think it sounds like to really get the most out of this, it's making that investment and putting that time in to really get a product that you- For you, because it's also an investment in yourself and what you're putting out into the world, you know, that always says something about you or sometimes by not saying something, you are saying something about you. So you put in that investment, you get the quality of property of, of the organism or the final product that you're looking for. And so I, I wrote down my notes, you know, don't necessarily rush out of the gate, right? When you have one success, but take the time to really hone it, craft it. And, and, and test your strains multiple times, <laughs> yeah. especially cordyceps. I mean, like you just... Don't get cocky with cordyceps is like another very important. <laughs> that's a good rule. Don't get cocky with cordyceps. <laughs> well, that's perfect, man. That that was the kind of advice I was looking for that I think people can run with. But if people do have more specific questions or more that they want to research into this, maybe one or two resources and then all of your contact information too, where people can find more about your work. Awesome. Some good, great resources. Definitely Google Scholar, you know, like reading about the mating systems and fungi, like you'll find a lot of random things. And my techniques personally for isolating ascospores and stuff, you know, that stuff isn't published yet. And 
you know, there's a reason I don't share that stuff. Like, I mean, it's like when you publish that stuff, like with a, a scientific university or something, like your name is like on it, it's stamped with a timestamp. You find in this line of stuff, like there's all different types of people. And like, I had to learn early on that, like, just because you're have similar interests to people, it doesn't mean you have the same intentions as certain people. Right. So you have to also protect the things that you have found in order to hopefully carve a living out for yourself. You know, if this is something that you're choosing to do as a career, because if you give it all away, like you're going to be left in the gutter with people taking credit for your stuff, because I see it happen all the time. Yeah. I pass crumbs out and I see what happens with how people present the information that I share, you know, different things like that. And you see the difference in the people that are have humility that give credit where it's due and the people that don't. So it's, yeah. uh, th that's another aspect about, you know, the mushroom medicine that has touched my life is not just, you know, what you learn from the mushrooms themselves, but also the people that you interact with, you know, on this path. And like, it should be no surprise that you're growing a parasitic mushroom and you're going to come across some parasites along the way. The law of correspondence in the universe uh, <laughs> is a real thing. And I think especially as we're talking, you know, it's very obvious that you're kind of this open hearted person. You have really altruistic goals, but people like that, people like yourself almost need to have more walls built up, more boundaries in a way to protect yourself because there'll be plenty of people out there that will be okay with abusing that. I'm a people pleaser, you know, and I have to be very careful with, <laughs> with how I let people make me feel. Yeah, boundaries are huge for me, you know, and that's, that's a big part of, I mean, I've been looking forward to this interview, but like this took my whole day over in my brain, you know, like that's just the type of personality that I have. Like I can't focus on my work if I have lots of things set on the schedule and, and different things like that, or lots of interactions with people really changes, you know, my internal compass of myself. I can handle pretty decently, you know, the interactions on social media and stuff, people asking me questions, you know, sometimes if it's one after another, you know, it starts to feel a little entitled. Like I'm not here to just like. <laughs> yeah, let me send you my consulting agreement. And, <laughs> and that's the other thing is like, I don't really do consulting, you know, at this point, because I've been in so many situations in my life to where I was selling my time, you know, like I was a music teacher yeah. for some time. The way that I felt when I was selling my time versus letting my time be for myself that I can apply towards research and whatever I want to do, you know, in those moments, maybe it's not the most mentally sound for people that want to function, you know, in the world with people all the time. But for me, I've had to create those boundaries for sure, socially as well. Well, and I think you just gave out some awesome advice that I think a lot of people are going to resonate with, especially people who are kind of more attuned or more sensitive, like myself, I find a lot of myself in what you're talking about. So I really appreciate you. Uh, open it up and being willing to share. And it even means more than that you take the time out to kind of spend this time with us, dropping down your story and dropping down knowledge. I really appreciate that. And then where is the best place for people to find you at your work? I know on Instagram, it's terrestrial fungi. Anywhere else we need to know about? Terrestrialfungi.com. You can find cultures. You can find uh, mushroom soap made by Heather from uh, rusticrosette.com. You can find me on uh, Facebook, terrestrial fungi. Uh, Facebook, Ryan Paul Gates. I'm pretty much all over those platforms. Uh, I'm on Ryan Paul Gates on Instagram as well. You can find my music through my Instagram. I have a band camp, uh, narayanaya.bandcamp.com. Narayanaya is a little tricky to spell, but you can find it through. Um... If you search Ryan Paul Gates, I'm going to be honest, one of the first things that comes up is your music. And I had to double check myself. I was like, is that, is that Ryan Paul Gates? That is Ryan Paul Gates. When I saw the cover of it, just really quick about that. You know, you said before the interview, for you, they're inexorably intertwined. And we talked about how like music has given you a lot of skills you needed to then work with the fungi in your own unique way. Yeah, I guess energetically, how are those things tied together a little bit for you? There was a big struggle for a long time, like as far as choosing that career path. I went to college for music, you know, but oh, wow. I, I struggled through my undergrad. Like I was full time for seven years trying to finish my undergrad. You know, I changed my major from music technology to jazz studies to Eventually, I finished with a Bachelor of Arts in Music because there was some stuff that messed up to where I didn't take certain courses I needed to finish my degree and I needed to be there for another two years. Gotta love that credit system. Finish my undergrad. You know, I went to a state university. I went to Wayne State University and I, I had some really great professors there. I had some not so great professors there too. And I also went to a school that I didn't 
I didn't like seek out the professors that were in charge of the program that I was studying under, you know, so I was still like trying to find my bearings. I was just, I was a cattle at a university, you know. As most of us are at 18 going into that environment, yeah. Yeah, you know, so, so like that's, I guess, where music has played in for me. And I'm hoping now that I've kind of sort of retired from music, and like that happened at a perfect time. So I I started to go into this early in the interview and I, I got distracted and I was talking about going and hunting with Jeff last summer in the Appalachian mountains, you know, I was drinking mountain spring water, you know, like just kind of taking it all in. And like my, my approach with this stuff has always kind of been influenced by the shamanic traditions of, you know, indigenous people, like, you know, especially in Peru with ayahuasca and the plant diets and that approach of, of utilizing the scientific method within your own vessel and creating sort of a, a controlled experiment through ingesting certain things, you know, like creating that dialogue has been an important thing for me, you know, on this path. And so, you know, I went down and hung with Jeff and I drank this spring water and stuff in the mountains and, and everything. And I ended up getting some sort of virus. Like I got taken over by like a fever or, so, you know, something. It was like a 24 hour thing. It was real nasty. I had to drive myself back home to Detroit from uh, Pittsburgh. And um, this virus was the thing that really pushed me over the edge to finally focus full time on, on this and give up wow. doing the professional music thing, you know. And there have been some interesting things like that. Like there was a time that I I got this really bad neurovirus or like weird poisoning or something when I was spending a lot of time like in the Ganoderma bogs, like harvesting Ganoderma suge. I went on this camping trip or whatever and I was harvesting Ganoderma. But this sort of dialogue between these other organisms within the biosphere and how that sort of shaped my path has been really fascinating. So definitely wanted to touch on that powerful story. And honestly, it reminds you a little bit, you might know of Louise Hayes. She's a medical intuitive that talks about when certain things show up and you get some kind of illness in the body, you get a reaction somewhere. It's actually telling something that you need to know on kind of a more metaphysical, energetic level. Like, oh, you have a sty in your eye. What are you not seeing in your life? And, you know, things like that. So it sounds like there is a lot of that happening. You were getting signals and maybe it wasn't as clear cut as, you know, you had the virus. And then once you made the decision to commit oh, no, to fungi, I mean, the, the virus cleared up. But I was having gout attacks. Like I was having my, the joints in my fingers were swelling constantly. I mean, I had to change my whole diet, everything up, you know, and I had been on so many different diets for the last 20 years, really, like from being vegan to like raw food to trying to eat everything, you know, like, so, right. so many different things. So like, I've tried to eat healthy so many times, you know, but <laughs> Now, finally, at like 34, I feel like I've got it finally dialed in. Like I, you know, have reversed so many health issues and really grateful to, you know, a lot of body workers and other types of intervention that has allowed me to keep doing this work because it's very rigorous work, really doing lab work all day and uh, moving, even growing mushrooms on substrate is really hard. I don't know how the commercial guys keep going with the scale that they do. Probably had to ride the waves a lot as you went on your journey, but I'm glad you're in a place now where things have kind of settled in and hopefully you'll be dialed in for a while because I think you're doing great work. So I hope this is the this is the right path. And those are all the cues that you get there. I have a couple of questions that I ask all my guests. And the first one is about, you know, a mushroom that you love. And I have a feeling we could easily go with cordyceps or Ganoderma, obviously. But maybe what's another mushroom that you love that you want to share with the audience? And why does it hold a fascination for you? You know, I thought about this earlier and I've, you know, I'm such a tunnel vision kind of person that this is it's really hard. I mean, obviously, maitake comes to mind because it's maitake season right now. I didn't get very many this season. It's been pretty dry here, but I got a few a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I'm hoping to maybe get a few last minute, you know, this season. But that seems boring to say maitake. I mean, there's got to be something else, but I'm just I'm drawing a blank. So <laughs> we can go with maitake because maitake is an amazing mushroom, and for me, it's not boring because when I lived on the East Coast, I wasn't really into mushrooms, and now that I move out in the West Coast got really into mushrooms and like my favorite one to eat is maitake, but we don't get it out here. That's one that really is has a special place in my heart. So I like that answer. And then the next question, something that I think we've really hinted at throughout the whole conversation and kind of put together a picture, but what has fungi brought to your life, a relationship with fungi? What has that brought to your life? You know, maybe it's a spiritual level, maybe it's just perspectives, but what has that relationship with fungi that you've developed given to you? It's given me a sense of connection and purpose. It's made it completely clear, like how I should be focusing my time and energy. You know, it's, it's helped me to 
reconcile some of the inherent waste that's parts of our culture. You know, it's helped me kind of see past all of that. It's also given me a sense of like sort of this continuum between like past and future, because I think a lot of people, they assume like, oh, well, we need to get back to like being connected to plants and and doing these things. For me, like there's so many things that our ancestors weren't connected to because they didn't even know how to use them yet. You know, so like, especially like something like cordyceps, if you asked me to grow all of my food for all of next year, I'd be screwed. Totally. You know, even people that like growing things and like that have experience growing plants, you know, like we've been so disconnected from those tasks of like how to prepare for winter, so to speak. But like, what have we gained in exchange for that? Like I'm growing this organism that is like a needle in a haystack in the woods that like maybe indigenous people had a use for this thing. I mean, I would assume most likely that they did, but you know, that knowledge has obviously been lost through their extermination and subjugation. So, but, you know, we have a unique opportunity now to like create our arcs, our space arcs, because like if this, if this ship doesn't make it, we still have to preserve the parts of it that we find most beautiful. That's, I guess, what my mission is, is to just hone in on those things that I find most fascinating and, and that hijack my system and go into that. I like what you're saying about it's not always about going back. There isn't some idyllic past that we're going to, it's all about how are we going to move forward and incorporate the things that we have now with some knowledge that maybe we can reconnect with and bring forward. Uh, I really like that idea. Yeah. And hopefully once we need to start building spaceships to get off this planet and go somewhere new, I have a feeling fungi are going to be intimately, intimately involved in that. Absolutely. And then finally, another huge question that I think you you spoke a lot to already, but what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? And this could be, you know, just the whole body of work with the music you put out in the world, with how you work with mushrooms, put that out in the world. I mean, how you choose to show up in your relationship, but what's the lasting impact you hope to make with that body of work? This is a very profound question and I feel ill prepared to answer profound questions. (laughs) You know, I, I definitely know that that impact has been made. You know, I I hope that the extent of that impact will grow. What I want that legacy or whatever to look like, you know, I don't really know because all I could really ask for is to like have a a slight imprint on the genome of of an organism, you know, and I've been able to have an impact on many. And like, that's the other thing is like, that's what humans have always done, right? Like that's kind of like a birthright to like select seeds and plant them in the ground and like, pick the favorite, your favorite one and like, you know, replant those seeds. And like, so like, that's all I could really ask for as far as like a contentment level, you know, like I said, as far as like connection and like purpose, like that's sort of covered. If the legacy is to help to usher in that paradigm shift of people connecting more to their passion of us sort of changing our default behaviors within this sinking ship that we call society and culture, you know, Hopefully I can play a role in, in allowing fungi to colonize every last person on this planet. And that's like one really cool thing about fungi is like when you study them and you work with them, you kind of get a sense of how relentless they are. And like, it's sort yeah. of encouraging to know that like we're reaching critical mass in so many ways. And I really do think that's going to have a profound impact on our species. I don't think you could ask for a nobler or more profound impact than that. And I love that idea of you're affecting the evolutionary history of an organism. I mean, what more of a quote unquote legacy could, could you ask for? We're doing it by accident, but. You know, to do it with intentionality to hopefully kind of improve the state of our species and that species is something pretty amazing. Well, Ryan, you know, like I said, I'm a huge fan. It was an absolute joy to get to talk with you. And I just appreciate you being really open and walking through, you know, the specifics of how you do what you do, but then also opening up into some broader concepts and really giving us just a lot of good information in so many different ways. So it was an honor, man. Appreciate you coming on the Mushroom Hour. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure.